Welcome to the Mad Love Your Life Show. I'm Mary D, the Joy Catalyst, here to be your host and transformation guide. Mad Love is about the mad, making a difference, and love is what we serve up to live a delicious life. My intention is to help you spark new ideas, break limiting beliefs, and align with your deepest dreams and desires. Get ready for laughter, inspiration, and finding your inner roar in every show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Mad Love Your Life show. This week, I have a very special guest for you, and I want to give him a grand introduction. Uh, But before we get started, I want to say thank you all for the birthday wishes. Last week was my birthday week. My birthday was Friday, March 1st, and it's exciting to do another turn around the sun. Uh, Thank you all for letting me share my best tips with you. Excuse me. Um, and I'm saying last Friday because my birthday has lasted all month. It was actually two Fridays ago. <laughs> but thank you all for the birthday love and the birthday wishes. I don't think I said that to you on the last show. So again, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you for your likes and your follows and your comments. I love it when you all drop into my DMs. And it's just, it's an inspiration to me to see that uh, I don't I don't just get to plant seeds. I actually get to see the gardens grow. So thank you for giving me the joy of seeing your gardens grow as you as you go through this fun trip called life. So today, without any further ado, I have a beautiful guest. His name is Trevor Etienne, and he is based out of um, Los Angeles as well as the UK. He is a British-based actor, director, producer. He just wrapped up shooting a movie in Poland uh, called The Silent Twins, and he recently guest starred in seasons five and six of Bosch on Amazon Prime. For those of you that love that show, it's been, been going on for quite a while now. His movie work includes featured roles in Terminator Salvation, Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, the Curse of the Black Pearl, another movie you might have heard of called Bad Boys 2, Black Hawk Down, and Eyes Wide Shut. I could probably spend the next 20 minutes literally going through all the amazing films and movies that he's been through. He really has been, um, he's not just in movies, he's been a, a character in video games, and uh, he's also been on TV, which for those of you that are not in the industry, sometimes the crossover is really hard to go from uh, TV and movies and back and forth. And he really is just a, a beautifully trained artist and also a wonderful heartfield human. And we're going to talk about that today because he also does work with kids. And uh, I don't want to steal all the thunder by reading through the bio. You can also do that in the show notes. But uh, one last thing I'll say is he did train with the BBC as a director and radio producer, uh, wrote and directed his first short BBC film called The Promise of Strangers. And his credits include writing, producing, directly, and directing Um, both comedy as well as a a huge genre of films. And with that, I want to say, Trav, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I love to start off people with with some easy questions and then we'll we'll ease into more juice. Uh, And so to kick us off, I would love to know, you know, you come from this great industry of entertainment. Uh, Tell me what got you started? Like what had your, what caught your eye? What caught your interest in being in front of the camera? Because for a lot of people, that's mortifying. It's mortifying to think about all eyes on you, all cameras on you, memorizing lines, having to change character. So what was it that made you go, oh, I got this. This is, this is what I'm going to do for a living. Uh, Wow. Um, Well, that's an interesting story, Mary. Um, So it kind of, happened in a very strange way. Um, I had a stutter when I was a kid. Okay. And um, I was very shy. I didn't speak much. I was quite introverted. And um, I went to lots of drama at school and just fights with kids and stuff because when you have a stutter, kids always uh, mimic you and, you know, tease you and stuff. So I didn't speak much. So um, what I find myself doing just unconsciously is I used to watch a lot of old movies, gangster movies. And I started watching James Cagney. And one day I was watching James Cagney in a film called Angels with Dirty Faces, which I've watched a hundred times since. And I realized that James Cagney's speech pattern 
was similar to my speech pattern. Because when you have a stutter, you basically try and race through the words so you don't get caught up with the certain uh, kind of breathing or if there's a K or a J or a T or a B, you try and rush through it so you don't get caught in mid-sentence and then you can't finish the sentence. So I realized right. that James Cagney spoke in a similar rhythmic pattern to how I spoke when um, I was trying to get a sentence uh, through and just, you know, make myself understood. So I unconsciously started speaking like James Cagney and I started going to school and I started doing this kind of American New York gangster accent. And I realized that when I spoke in this New York gangster accent, and I'm a London kid, so I'm a million miles right. away from that reality. But I found that when I spoke in that rhythm, I didn't stutter. And I thought, oh, this is kind of, I didn't really understand why I didn't stutter, but I just realized that I didn't stutter. So the more gangster movies I used to watch from that Warner Brothers table, Edward G. Robinson, Humphrey Bogart, John Garfield, and all that, I realized that they all spoke in this very quick 1930s rhythmic gangster pattern. And that pattern suited my pattern in how I could get through a sentence. So I started speaking like that. And one day I said to my teacher, what does James Cagney do? And she said, he's an actor. And I said, what's that? And she said, well, it's someone who can pl play different roles and, you know, experiment with the art form and everything else. And uh, it's a job. And I said, a job? You mean you get paid? She went, oh, yeah, it's a career. And it never occurred to me up until that point that healing the way I spoke as a child could then lead on to me taking it further as an artist. It never, but um, as time went on and more teachers came to my aid and supported me trying to be creative, my writing and just, you know, expressing myself and being an actor and doing stuff at school, um, it slowly started to dawn on me that I could actually use this platform, this opportunity to express myself which is what I had been trying to do earlier as a child when I didn't speak. So the fact that I could now trust this way of speaking to be a way of me expressing myself kind of mm -hmm. expanded into me becoming an artist. I know that sounds uh, crazy, but that's kind of how it happened. Amazing. Amazing. So you really weren't, you weren't the starry eyed kid that was necessarily saying, well, I want to grow up and do this particular thing. You were, it ended up being something you, you were inspired to do. Who, who would you say, like, if you look back on your career, especially early on, early on before you had the success that you have now, like who was the, was there a particular person you know, was it that particular teacher or was it somewhere along, someone else along the line that really like encouraged you or made you see yourself in the work that you, that you now get to do today? Uh, there were a couple of great teachers um, at school. Uh, there was a wonderful Australian teacher called Miss Old and she was a real champion and really encouraged me um, to go outside of school and explore what other theater groups might be around. And then there was another wonderful teacher called uh, Miss Dutch, Yvonne Dutch, and Margaret Old and Yvonne Dutch were like the kind of uh, mentors, if you like, who opened my mind to something bigger than what I understood the art to be. Yeah. The theater, I started going to youth theaters and auditioning, and it just opened up a whole new world for me. But I think maybe the one mentor that just stayed with me even to this day, uh, was Sidney Poitier and maybe Harry Belafonte. And um, they, they basically, they look like me and they were doing things in that world that I didn't know was possible because in England it was slightly different. You were getting a very different perspective of what was achievable. Um, and I was seeing these guys create opportunities and do things that I knew was possible, but I didn't see where mm. I was surrounding me. So that inspired me to kind of start my engine. And then because I was always interested in writing and doing my own stories, I was in a 
youth theatre group called the Anna Shear, um Theatre Group. Uh, she just passed with her husband, but mm. bless, them, bless them both, because wonderful people. And they really inspired me to write and try and put my ideas on paper and express myself. So I would say that there hasn't been any one mentor. It's been a kind of combination of different sure. people, uh, including sure. my family. Obviously, my family, my mom, mm. uh, all my sisters and my brother and my daughter, uh, my dad. There was just a, a, a kind of uh, support that was just encouraging me to try something. And obviously, it was getting me out of my shyness. It was getting me out of me being kind of, you know, stuck on how to express myself. Because by now, I'd worked out a pattern of how I could speak. So it was a strange one because it came through the healing, if you like. I had to heal how I spoke. And in mm -hmm. healing how I spoke, it allowed me to change the perception of myself. Mm, I love that. I love that. When we, let's talk about healing because I think that is such a beautiful subject. And I don't know that we talk about it in relation to uh, in, to most things. I think people are, are you know, they say, hey, I have this thing going on, this stutter, this ache, this pain, this whatever is in their mind in terms of what they consider something that needs to be healed, a trauma. And when we think about those things, tell me, like, what was the beginning of your healing journey? At what point did you say, hey, there's there's a healing that needs to happen? For, was, it, was it that? Was it the realization of there's a healing that needs to happen? Or was healing just taking place? Like what? Like what? At what point could you actually say, verbalize, and consciously be aware that healing was what was happening and what needed to happen? Uh, that's interesting. Um, oh, that's interesting. I think it was. It was so unconscious, because um, I came from a family that was. Um, a Caribbean family based in London um, and in those early days the family unit was was very tight it was very connected so um, the healing kind of happened but it wasn't discussed if that makes sense mm, yes yes because I think that's I think a lot of people can relate to that especially yeah. those that are are on their healing journey now or know that they are and may have done things like taking a break from their family. And for those of you watching and listening, I, I really want you to hear this because this could be you without you consciously realizing that's what happened. So for example, if there is a little voice inside your head that says, hey, I need to take a break from social media or I need to take a break from because of all the you know this is in the US it's a it's a political year I mean, we have a, an election year happening and so there can be a lot of stuff going on online and that can be very jarring for people's nervous system it can be very jarring for belief systems sadly it can be jarring for friends and family who are not on the same side of agreement on on what you know who needs to be in political power and when that happens uh, along with things like the way the person might speak to you or the way they may treat you if your voice inside says i need a break from this person this media this whatever then that's that's your your internal intuitive self your spirit telling you hey like this is the solution and too many times i think people talk themselves out of setting those boundaries or setting those standards or just shutting something off that just needs to be off. And I and so I love your story around like, wow, like this healing is just kind of happening like unconsciously until the moment where you can be here now and say consciously, hey, I know that that's what was happening is I was going through a healing process. Would you say there are any other areas that have shown up for you in that way? Like what brings you from an unconscious knowing to a conscious knowing like what was what was the shift for you well um well i guess um i believe in miracles mm, and uh, i've witnessed lots of miracles um and i always think that we take miracles for granted because we don't know that sometimes when we think something is not working we we attach ourselves to the pain of that and we think it's personal. 
that it's not happening for us or to us in that moment. And I think that can um, blur the perception of what a miracle looks like. It's like, you know, sometimes you're running for that bus and you miss that bus and you think, oh, I'm going to be late for my meeting. And then you get to the meeting and they're running late. But you've had all this anxiety about showing up on time and you don't realize that maybe that five minutes that interrupted what you wanted to control was something controlling that five minutes for you because it was something else. And maybe on that bus that you took, you met someone who became the love of your life. Mm, yeah. Or yeah. you met someone that gave you something inspirational that you now take into the meeting that gives you a different perspective of how to walk into this interview or this meeting just by somebody saying one sentence. And you yeah. don't see a miracle. You think, oh, that's just happenstance and that's just how life works. But I believe that we experience so many miracles on a daily. And I believe that if we raise the frequency of how we try and live, and that means that the frequency is that we learn forgiveness, because that's a frequency. Mm -hmm. Yes, and absolutely. Lovers, lovers can't forgive. You know, we live in a world that's very angry, makes us angry. It's very self-obsessed. So it makes us self-obsessed, self very driven by images and quotes. And we look at people's behavior and we judge it and we cancel it. So that's the lens that we look at the world that we live in. And it's like, if we're all listening to Jazz FM, and that's the perception of the world we live in, then everyone's on a Jazz FM frequency. But if we knew that there was another frequency that we could elevate to, that was a spiritual FM, or love FM, or something that just wasn't a gimmick, something that was actually about us loving and surviving as a village, mm. where we look after the elders and we pull the ladder down for the youngsters and we show the youngsters how to survive just like animals do in the wild. You know, the penguin has to learn how to catch fish. Right. Uh, you know, the baby chick has to learn how to walk. Right. And, so, um, and if we were less distracted with the uh, FM frequency that takes our frequency to a certain sonic sound level, and we could elevate ourselves into a, a level that was alien to us. Mm. Yeah, I think fear is seen as something we have to run away from. And Ooh, I, think I love that. And on that note, we are going to take a quick commercial break and we're going to come back and continue our conversation with Trev on Miracles. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the B. BBM Global Network. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. 
Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. And welcome back. We are going to continue our conversation with Trev, our beautiful show producer, actor, writer on uh, so many topics today, but we are on the topic of miracles and how sometimes not everyone recognizes when a miracle is happening. And we're sure, at least I'm sure, I'm sure you are too, Trev, that miracles happen all the time. And I want to go back to something you said before commercial break, which was like, how often do we not recognize something is a, is a miracle? Like those, you know, we were, we were late for something, but then we ended up meeting someone like on the ride to the thing that we were late for. And then it, they end up sticking with us in our life. And we kind of bypass that as just coincidence or just something that happened. And in the same way, there's um, a writer uh, back in the not a writer, a uh, musician. And I, I'm pretty sure it was Garth Brooks who had this song. It was called, uh, I thank God for unanswered prayers. And that, and the whole song is, a, is that's the whole chorus line is sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. And it's, it's about those moments of like, not just what do we not realize happens, but also what are we asking for or what are we putting out into the world that man we want to marry that woman we want to be with that you know job that we want that career that we want to hold on to that part that we want to get in a in a movie how often do we ask for that and when we don't get it we think oh i've been it's a i've made a mistake or this opportunity has passed me by like how many times has that been a miracle how many times has that been the blessing how many times has that been the gold for us in not in necessarily even the coincidences that show up but also in the things that we think we want in that moment or in a space and time and then we realize later on wow like that wasn't that wouldn't have been great for me or that wasn't great for me and that we allow something better to show up in our lives. We've create space for something bigger and better to show up. I think those, those are also the miracles that we don't always account for. And, uh, and I, I always wonder when we are finished in this particular plane of life, will we get to have that movie that goes on that shows us all of the ways that we've been, that we've met a blessing that really could have been, you know, something more dangerous or it could have, you know, things could have gone a different way. And instead we got to, to walk a new road. Um, and, and sometimes maybe the road that we think is less traveled, maybe we did do a thing and there was even a consequence. What if there was a worse consequence that could have come out of it? But we, we miss seeing that as a blessing. And I also think this is where people see like glass half empty, glass half full. I think these are those moments. And the more, the more we can try and see that glass as half full or even overflowing, those are the opportunities we get to actually show up and go, oh, so many miracles that are happening in my life right now or have happened in my life right now. And can I count them up and see what they are? And speaking of miracles, I want to go to the work that you have been doing uh, with children because you also uh, have done work with kids also in the arts. And I would love to know like what inspired you to get involved with assisting children in, in the arts? Well, um, for me, um, I was, uh, I came from a background that didn't have any uh, industry benefits, let's say. Um, and I came through a kind of community theatre uh, training where um, I was with a, a mentor, theatre director, uh, actor, genius man called Larrington Walker. And uh, he allowed me to express myself as a teenager. And I set up a theatre company with him when I was 17. And we were based in a place called Brixton. Uh, the company was called Afro Sax. And we ran it with a few other actors, Ellen Thomas, uh, Carmen Amati, who was our administrator, God rest in peace, both 
Carmen and Larry have since passed. Um, God rest them both. Um, and uh, Jeffrey Kassoon, Bram Bell, Marie Berry, the Bamaros, Angela Ma. We had a, a, a group of wonderful artists, um, uh, Ricky, Patrick, just wonderful people that were around us, um, actors. And it was because it was community based and we were all young at the time. It just seemed like the natural thing to do to support the arts where there wasn't much support for the community and help the youngsters find their purpose, help them find their creative purpose. Because a lot of the time in urban communities globally, the disenfranchised and the ones that are disadvantaged get left, get left behind. You know, their values, their opinions, their purpose doesn't matter to the mainstream construct of how we live. So my thing was always, well, someone gave something back to me. It's only natural for me to give it back to young children or young adults, young teenagers. I've worked in prisons. Um, I've spoken to young, young uh, adults who've been in trouble with the law, trying to mentor and share some guidance. Um, and I think w when you give back, it just feels like the right thing to do because uh, we become the elders of tomorrow. You know, we were the youngsters once and as we get older, we become the elders and we have to learn from the elders who have come before us. And if they gave us something in order to build a foundation, I think it's very natural that we give it back to the youngsters. And I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier about fear. I think we're born with this innate idea to be attached to fear and we learn from the people around us how to respond to fear so do we challenge fear or do we run away from it do you hide from it right. and i think when you're teaching young people through the creative process how to deal with their fears their anxieties um, you can see how that confidence starts to shape how they start to walk and present themselves in the world and that to me is a plus because so many young people don't get the opportunities um, because of where they live the zip code their background their education their financial status and i just think that we all rich poor young old globally we all have to find something to give back because we're getting it every day from someone's controlling our breathing, something's controlling our heart rate, something's right. controlling our pulse, something's controlling how we think. And I think because we don't live in a world that is perfect, it means that we are not perfect. So if we are not perfect, what is it that we actually fear? If we upset people because we were misinformed or we did something that maybe we misjudged or just you break a glass, you step on someone's foot, you do something that wasn't intentionally designed to hurt someone. I think we have to be in a space where we have to have the compassion and the empathy to mm. say, I know you didn't mean that. I know that's not consistent with who you are. Right. That was uh, a, a, a human error that we all have. And we have to learn to find the compassion to be forgiving. And I think if we can forgive, and believe you me, I've been in situations where I found it very hard to forgive um, because people have been not very nice. Their behavior has been challenging, sure. even, within, even within my own family at times. Um, but I think, I think the first thing you have to do when you're trying to teach youngsters is to look at yourself and learn how to forgive yourself. And I've made mistakes. I've mm -hmm. not intentionally um, done things to hurt people, but I know that at times my behavior or my actions have hurt people. And I've tried to apologize in the best way I can so that it's a meaningful apology coming yeah. from the heart, saying, I'm so sorry if I've offended you, um, or if, if, you know, please, please forgive me or, you know, just whatever. And if somebody wants to hold on to that, 
because they feel attached to the pain, whatever that gives them, a power, a, a position, whatever, an advantage, a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. you, you yourself, as the apology person, can't fit that. You can't try and get into their space to try and understand why they won't let go or why they won't embrace forgiveness or why their forgiveness comes with conditions. Right. Some forgiveness comes with conditions. So right. I think what I try and do with myself on a daily and with when I'm teaching young people, I try and share with them. I learned something a long time ago that you have to observe life, not absorb it. Mm. When you tell, absorb, us what that, tell us what that means. So when you absorb life, you're kind of looking at life from a Google Earth point of view where your perspective is like like a drone above. And when you're looking from above, you see the landscape and the situation below you in a very different way than you would if you're looking at it up close. Because up close is micro. If you're Google Earthing it, that's macro, that's bigger. So mm -hmm. I try and look at situations, especially the ones that hurt me or the ones where I know I may have hurt somebody. I try to macro that position and I try to accept that life isn't fair and life isn't nice sometimes and life can be painful. And mm -hmm. sometimes things just happen to you without any provocation you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and you're the one that gets wet from the rain or the puddle splashes on you, whatever. And mm. you can take it personal and go, why me? Uh, but it might have just been your turn to have stood in that space and just got that experience. And if you can accept that it's your turn, I, I, I always say, you, you know, like in, in relationships, when you're dating someone and it ends, sometimes you attach yourself to the ending and you can't let go because you attach yourself to the pain and what right. it meant for it to end. But I think sometimes you have to accept that uh, that relationship was never yours. It was just your turn to be in it. Right. And, and once that turn is over, like the Ferris wheel, that uh, Google Earth uh, zone POV that you get from the top of the Ferris wheel, or in the UK we have like the London Eye, but if you're on top of the fairground Ferris wheel and you're the one at the very top, you're the number 12 in the mm -hmm. clock face and you see mm -hmm. it from that TV, then you have that window. That space is all about how you see that window, that, that, that vision, that perception. But there's somebody coming in the next carriage behind you who's now going to get that and you're going to go down and then it goes round. So that space that you occupied where you were at the peak, at the number 12 of the Ferris wheel, that space was never yours. It was just your turn mm -hmm. to be at the top mm -hmm. of the Ferris wheel. And then you enjoy that window for what it's worth. And then it goes and it's somebody else's turn. And then it's the person behind them. So I think that's life. You can't attach yourself to what you think is yours because it never is yours. It's just your turn to win yes. the Oscar. It's your yeah. turn to get the promotion. It's your mm -hmm. turn. To get the parking space. You know? Yes, yes, so juicy, Trev. So juicy. You're so right. It, it's it's life is a series of things being your turn, and then not your turn. And and there's also I think a belief system that if we can all show up and and even if you don't believe it all the time, if you can choose to believe it in waves, serves all of us, which is that there's more than enough for everyone. And when there's more than enough for everyone, we all know we can all take a turn. We can all be joyful for the person who got the Golden Globe or the person who got the promotion. We can cheer them on and say, yes, yay, I'm so glad for you. And I hope that I will show up with the same exuberance. I want someone to show up when it's my turn and when I get to be celebrated. And I love everything that you're saying because everything that you're talking about are all lessons in leadership. These are, and, and I believe that when we talked, when we first started this piece of the conversation, we were talking about your work with children. And this is why I think it's beautiful because I do believe it's at these young ages that we get these 
this is where the seeds are planted for us around leadership and how we're going to continue to look at the world as we grow up. I definitely came from a disadvantaged home up until about mm, junior high school. Then I transitioned only because my sister was teaching at a private school. I also got to go to private school. And so it wasn't because we could afford private school. I was there on a scholarship. Uh, and well done, well done, but that, well done. yeah, thank you. But that was a transition that I'm so grateful for because I learned so many things coming from a background that was disadvantaged where I was this latchkey kid home alone all the time into coming into like, oh, like now I'm a miniature adult, right? Like junior high and high school, folks, for any of you watching who have kids, if your kid is a teenager, they are literally like five or six years from becoming an adult. They are like mini adults right now. And this is where they're going, they're learning all the things that they're going to enter adulthood with. And and this is their knowing, this is going to be their learning, their lessons. And that's why I think that this investment that you've made in youth is amazing. And that with these principles that you're talking about, they are principles too many people don't still do today, that if they did do them, they would find makes their workplaces better, makes their homes better, makes their church groups better, makes their communities better, because it is that, how can I cheer you on when it's your turn, knowing that eventually it's going to be my turn. And that life is is like that Ferris wheel where everyone's going to get their turn at the at the 12 o'clock spot to, to, to get the best views and the greatest views. And the crazy part is perception your own perceptions are your reality because there could be some of you who are getting your 12 o'clock spot, which we talked about is like the top of the world, it's the top of the view. And some of you are showing up going, oh, this is too scary. Please take me back down to six so I can be back down at the bottom. <laughs> and that's, yeah. that's the other crazy part of it is how often does that Ferris wheel get to the 12 o'clock spot? And instead of savoring it and actually being able to enjoy the moment, we allow fear to jump in. We allow this negative self-talk to take over to where we don't even get to enjoy that moment. And I think that's another thing we also see a lot in Hollywood. Well, I'll say this. We, it happens across the board, but it's, it's sensationalized in Hollywood because when we think of an actor who's done a thing, right, their life is on zoom lens and now everyone's like familiar with who that person is uh, and it makes me think back to uh i remember reading this article on madonna and she was saying how she was in an elevator with some fans and one of the fans actually looked at her and said hey i really don't like what you've done with your hair it looks <laughs> terrible and she and it was so strange and to her it was like what stranger would ever look at another stranger and say, hey, I don't like what you've done with your hair? You know, if your best friend did it, that might be a different scenario, but a stranger to look at you as if they know you well enough that they can give you know do, give you this criticism and i thought it's so true like it, it's the the lens of which people show up in or uh, you know or don't show up in <laughs> depending on how you're looking at it can can be so different and so like did you really did we really just say that did that really just happen instead of being able to 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 celebrate someone and and see them in this this beautiful light for being uh, who we are, right? Of, of that ultimately, like my personal belief is that we are all connected. And so it's, it is such a mirror to show up and see people and be able to in, help them enjoy their success or enjoy where they're at or nurture them. And the same way that we also would love to receive that. And in these lessons in leadership, this is where I see people failing the most because they're either jealous or they're worried about, oh, is someone going to take my role or my position? You know, they forget that there's a way for us to all have a turn and that there's more than enough. And it's in that scarcity window that we lose hope. It's in the scarcity window that we separate ourselves from others. It's in that scarcity window where underserved youth don't get to be inspired and cared for. And I don't know, uh, for all of you who are listening and watching, there is a teacher who is near and dear to me. Her name is Ladessa White, or at least 
that was what her name was when she was my teacher. And I'm pretty sure it's still her name today. But she ended up becoming the superintendent of the Bonham Elementary um, School District, which is in Abilene, Texas. And I have been looking for her. She is not on social media. She is hard to find. I have my team trying to locate her because Trev, as we were talking about mentors and people who have impacted our lives, she is a teacher who was she just saw something in me. Mm. And I was a young kid who was home alone a lot. And I remember she took me to like her son's baseball game. And like, you know, I don't know what as a teacher, what made her look at me and go, this kid stays home alone a lot. And I'm going to figure out a way to connect with her mom and see if maybe after school, I can go and invest some time with her. And it was just that care of looking, being able to look back and go, oh, wow, like, what is that? You know, and those things make a difference. They make a difference in a child's life. So congratulations to you for the work that you do with, ch with children. I am sure that it is something that um, doesn't go unnoticed and unrecognized. And it's, it's a way that you get to plant these beautiful seeds into, into the lives of, of, of uh, these children. And I do want to ask you, like, when you think back to, like, where you sit now with all of your experience in Hollywood and all your experience in life, like, what is, what's the thing that you know now that you wish you had known before, before you made that leap, before you got into the industry and the business? What would have been something that would have been so helpful for you to know? Because I'm sure there's some young actors and actresses, there's aspiring actors and actresses, there's people who may not even know that they're going to be an actor one day, like you, <laughs> or director or producer. And and what advice would you wish someone had given you before before you took that leap? Uh, well, that's an interesting question because I've kind of got an interesting answer. Uh, I got that advice. <laughs> you got that advice, okay. <laughs> I got that advice very early um, from... Uh, I, I was in a, a, I think it was a party or a event, and there was an actor. Um, hold on, I'm going to, because just as you've just mentioned your teacher's name, I yes. feel like I have to mention this actor's name. And the, the miracle um, of this moment was that. Um, uh, don't tell me I can't remember his name. Um, uh, Wait, was this the person that gave you bad advice? Because yes, I, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> yes. it's going it's to getting, it's getting get outed. <laughs> I forgot his name. I, I, I actually, I, I forgot his name. And then he, um, oh, this is terrible. Uh, because um, I, I forgot his name. And then I found his name recently. And... I could not believe that this was the guy that gave me this piece of advice. And I was so um, I'm honored that he gave me this advice. Um, I wanted to thank him. And oh. I, yeah, I wanted to thank him. And um, I, I didn't know his name, so I didn't know how to thank him. Oh, here we go. Um, so, ah, uh, oh, this is amazing. Okay, so his name is, um, uh, sorry about this. Uh, his name is um, Dickon. Dickon. Um, uh, Dickon Ashworth. Thank you, God. Ashworth. Okay. Dickon. So Dickon Ashworth. Uh, I met a wonderful actor. I met him in this uh, party or an event, and we got talking. And he told me very early. I must have been about eighteen. He said to me you can be the greatest actor or artist of your generation and still die an unknown. Oof. And he said to me, don't you think there were people better than Brando who never got the shot? Every star, every singer, every dancer, every band that ever made it, there was always another band that could have been as good as them, as good as the Beatles as good as Elvis, but sure. there was only, but there was only room for one. So mm -hmm. when I heard that piece of advice, that really put me in a very humble 
place with, with where to navigate the attachments of my desires, if that makes sense. Because mm -hmm. you get sure. attached to your desires and then those, those desires feed you. But then the second part of that, and this is where I can answer your question in terms of what would I like to have heard, um, I didn't understand how fear grooms you. Mm. Okay. Uh, I want you to hold that thought because we're going to go to a commercial break again. And okay. when we come back, then we're going to give everyone the juice. We'll, okay. give them, we'll give them the full answer. How about that? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> we'll be back. We'll be back after this commercial break. Dr. R.C. will share extraordinary resources and services that promote educational success as well as making a difference in the lives of all social workers as well as the lives of children, adolescents, and teens of today. She will have open discussions addressing many of the issues that we face about our youth and how being employed in the uniquely skilled profession of social work for over 18 years has taught invaluable lessons through her personal experiences. She will also provide real-life facts, examples, and personal stories that will confirm that why serving as a child advocate is extremely beneficial when addressing the needs of the whole child. Listen live to Dare to Soar, Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network. Network and tune in radio as Dr. RC will provide thought provoking information that will empower, encourage, and strengthen students, families, and communities across our nation. You can also visit her at soarwithkatie.com. Author, radio show host, and coach. John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. All right, and we are back. Trev, please continue so that we can continue to talk about these miracles, these people who have impacted our lives, and of course, just the beauty of life. Uh, so I had answered the first part of the question with the quotes. You yes, can... which the, and so everyone remembers the question was, what, what, what do you wish you, what do you know now that you wish you had known before you got started? And Trev indicated that he actually got some bad advice <laughs> and that he actually wants to go back and thank that person for that bad advice because uh, it, it, uh, it gave him some insights and, and this is where we're at. So fill us in. Well, and I'll, I'll just say that I never saw it as bad advice. Um, I saw it as real advice. Mm -hmm. um, because I think so many people walk into a career and it's good to have ambition and it's good to have drive and it's good to have a goal, but you have to be realistic as well because uh, being realistic means that you protect yourself from the miracles that don't happen. Mm. And when the miracles don't happen, you want to know that you've got a raincoat on and a hat and an umbrella or else you get wet in the rain and then you catch a cold. And that's not fun. So his advice I saw was very useful and very helpful and very humbling. And it was strange to hear that, but it made sense as well, because there might have been better actors than Marlon Brando. There might have been better actors or better bands than the Beatles. We'll never know because we just got that one narrative. Um, like I was saying, we all tune into the FM frequency of the planet so if the planet says this is the best band in the world, we might have known the alternative to the Beatles band. We might have thought they were the best band in the world, but we follow the narrative of what the FM frequency um, structure 
tells us. And I think uh, what I was saying about what I would like to have learned was how fear grooms you. Mm. From a child, you're groomed in fear. Don't. Stop. No. Yes. And you're trying to navigate what decisions are right for you as you navigate around fear. Do you wear the right clothes? Do you do this? Do you say that? Yeah. Do you move here? Do you play this sport? Do you go with this group of friends, this gang? This, it's a very uh, ever-changing scenario where each decision can lead to trauma. Each one, long-term trauma, where you're wounded for decades yeah. because that one choice that you made based on what you thought was safe what you may have researched and thought, oh, there's no fear here. I can date this person. I can take this job. I can be around these people. I can trust this group. Um, and fear, fear is as powerful as the emotional power you put behind it. Mm. And when you look at athletes and you see the Olympics and you know that all those athletes that are running the 100 meters, they've all trained for four years, all of them. They've worked hard, they've been up, they've you know, eaten the right food, they've trained really hard, they're in the gym, they're running at 4 a.m. or swimming or whatever they do, they're training for the Olympics or that sport, that football game, that NFL, that Premier League, that cricket match, whatever it is. And then when you see the race, we only focus on gold, silver, and bronze. That's all we care about. Right. We don't care about the runner who came in 11th or 15th. We don't think about them because their names and their importance aren't of importance to uh, the structure that's feeding us what we should pay attention to. Right. So we don't think about that 11th runner who trained as hard who did exactly the same things perhaps or more than the gold medalist winner did but because they came 11th they're discarded and that for me is where the fear grooms us because the fear takes our direction to look at the winners we always have to look at the winners and mm. the fear of losing becomes a purpose. We can't lose. We can't let this relationship go. Even though we know it's bad and it's abusive, we can't let it go. We can't let this job go, even though it's not paying us right and the hours are wrong and there's abuse in the job and the staff and, and HR aren't listening. We're not going to leave that job. We're not going to leave this house. We're going to sell that car. We get attached to what fear does because Fear tells you you know better. Fear tells you you're in control. Fear tells you that you don't need to apologize. Fear tells you that uh, you're, you're winning in your own mind. Whereas the reality is that you don't have the capacity to win because the people around you are going, you're a loser, you owe me this, you have to mm. pay. You've got to show up on time. You've got to see sure. that fact. You can't leave this gig. You can't you know you've got kids you can't leave this relationship so right i've learned how fear grooms us till we die fear grooms us when we're sick when we're dealing with illness loved ones mm -hmm. and we live in a uh, society that embellishes fear i'm in an industry that creates entertainment as fear horror movies, they frighten you, and that's right. entertainment. They give you computer games, and that's entertainment. And I'm not saying that that doesn't have a place in how we balance out life, but I think sometimes we discard the 11th runner who didn't win that race, and we don't see that 11th runner as a winner. Hmm. The fact that they qualified for the Olympics they qualified for that race. They got into that final. Right. They won. They won something. Yeah. Extraordinary. Absolutely. Yeah, I you're right. You're right. So many times there are people who have done the work 
and they just haven't been on the 12 o'clock spot yet. They haven't, that's not their time to be in the top three that we hear about, but there are so many other heroes or so many other people who are working hard or making hard choices or making right choices, making better choices uh, than a lot of times the people that we, we might be hearing about who might be in those, you know, first, second, third slots. And I think that that's just a reminder for all of us also to not get caught up in the analysis of comparing ourselves to everybody else. Because what if what if you are that 11th runner? You know, like, can there be recognition for yourself of saying like, I know I work hard, I wanna acknowledge myself. And like, what I do is great. I'm, I'm a, a great stay at home mom, if that's what you are. I'm a great startup CEO, if that's what you are. I'm a great serial entrepreneur, if that's what you are. I'm a great actor, actress, writer, producer a person who is aspiring to get to the place where you want to be recognized. Like there's the only measure most of us really should be creating is the one for ourself. What is your baseline and how can you optimize who you are and where you're at? So many people say, oh, I can't do X, right? Like I can't speak on stages might be the, the thing that you're saying. But man, I've seen uh, guys get up there with no arms and no legs and they have a full speaking career and they're amazing at it. They did, there's things that they needed and things that they didn't need to make it happen. And I think that there's so much beauty in that. All right, well with that, Trev, thank you for being our guest here on the Mad Love Your Life show. We are going to continue with an extended version over on my YouTube channel. And I'm so excited about continuing this conversation with you, but our time is wrapped for today here on Bold Brave TV. Thank you all for viewing, for listening in. I hope that if you have any questions that you'll you'll send those in and we'll, we'll answer those on the next show. And with that, uh, I do wanna just remind you to join us back here next week for another interesting and inspiring guest interview. And again, you can catch us here on Mad Love, uh, Mad Love Your Life here every Wednesday at 4 Eastern. And please head over to maryd.com to grab the link to my YouTube channel. And it's the Mad Love Your Life show there also. We post an extended version of the show each week so you can get even more great content. And until next time, may abundance always walk beside you. May joy always go before you and may love Love always guides you on your path. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to today's show. We air live every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Bold Brave TV. We hope to see you back next week. For more ways to connect with my guests, content, programs, and retreats, just head over to www.maryd.com and subscribe. That's M-A-R-Y-D-E-E.com. Thank you.